All right. Let me just back up and um, share this. Uh, in New York City, where I'm positioned with the City University of New York and the School of Labor and Urban Studies, right after COVID, I was invited to be part of a advisory council to the mayor for labor and workforce development. And that was to inform everybody about how to handle uh, COVID crisis and to pass the word out to the working people of New York. Um, I quickly was cynical about what that would mean, but I noticed that the word co-op came up a few times in those meetings while people were thinking about what we could do differently. And so I convened a working group that went on for about a year, and this gives you a sense of who was in that working group. One of the things that was, uh, read this quote, it doesn't matter what work you do, you're entitled to live a decent life. And that is the cooperative movement. That is the labor movement. That is the social justice movement. We are in our separate lanes, but I think we all need to understand that the goal is the same for all of us. And to the extent we can work together, we should. And that was Arthur Chiliotis, who was perhaps the most senior labor leader who attended these meetings regularly. And as a result, we put together what I consider a toolkit for unions uh, to think about cooperative solutions. And I noticed that Bernadette King Simmons is on this call. She helped put this together. It was based on those experiences as we listened for a year, one, uh, one meeting a month, what was going on in the co-op movement for unions in workforce development and particularly in our city. And we were able to look at these different tools as we pulled them out and said, basically, a union needs to have an openness to innovation. If you're open to innovation, you're going to be able to unleash other tools you have. Then there's the ability to help with contract negotiations, co uh, collective bargaining agreements, uh, purchasing agreements, professional expertise, like lawyers, like community, like uh, union organizers. Um, and researchers, so important that unions are able to have these people on their payroll and they could put them to work in these projects. That can help with sectoral analysis and understanding how an entire market may be impacted rather than just one business. And the unions can help with access to capital, offering space, and even uh, with help in training funds. So we wanted to put out these tools as a way for people to think about how they can use their union to help in uh, building out the co-op movement. And I want to take this moment um, for you to please put in the chat what union you're with if you are affiliated with a union. And if you're not affiliated with a union, you can say not affiliated, but it's helpful for us to know that people are uh, coming from which unions to this conference. And I wanted to just give an example of how these tools all came together in Maine when the machinists um, helped with the lobster men and women to put together Lobster 207. In this case, they had, uh, the story starts at a kitchen table where two brothers, one who was a machinist and one was a lobster man in Maine, were talking and the lobster man was complaining about the terms and conditions of his employment. And by regulation in Maine, the lobster men and women must only be one person. It's an, you're an independent contractor, you're one person, you can have a helper and you have a boat. And so there's a force in the market that everybody is like an independent contractor. So at that kitchen table that one brother said to the other, you should talk to my union. After a while, the organizer in that area got very involved with some lobster men and invited them all down to Maryland to their conference center. And over a period of a few weeks, they really put their heads together thinking about what do we need to do? And they researched policy. They came up with training that was needed. They found some dollars for training to bring in more people to learn about how we might turn this into a co-op. And they got uh, financing and they were able to actually change some of the regulation in Maine and organize a co-op that uh, is a, for all the, all the uh, lobster men and women can send their goods to that co-op. So they ended up actually purchasing a uh, distribution and production facility. The example there will take us now to look at a few others. And I'm going to um, pause the slides. I'm going to let Ray speak first from um, SEIU, United Healthcare West, how they did their story. And while she does that, I will come off the screen um, and stop sharing and let Ray have their voice on this um, 
at this. And I'll also put in the chat for everyone to see the toolkit that got published. Um, Ray, please. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm Maria Cristatello. I'm the Deputy Director of Research at SEIU United Healthcare Workers West. Um, and thanks for inviting me to join. I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, so our local is a, it's a statewide local in California of allied healthcare workers. Um, we have more than 100,000 workers in um, patient facing and back office type jobs. Um, and yeah, in Rebecca's description, the sort of sectoral analysis and a union being um, interested in um, in worker ownership and really kind of throwing down on um, investing in research and development of a co-op. That's kind of the end of the spectrum that I wanted to fill out a little bit by telling you about um, first a pilot and then a, a bigger staffing cooperative that uh, UHW helped develop. Um, so a little bit of background behind that um, is that uh, we were, you know, as a union and our membership and our um, research department thinking about the kind of host of workforce and work life issues um, that we were hearing concern about from our membership, um, which were not different than uh, workers in other industries. Um, but since we represent healthcare workers, uh, these are things like changing scopes of practice, um, making jobs feel less meaningful, um, less stable, um, constant attempts by hospital employers to contract out work, um, which in hospitals happens often in um, janitorial and food service type positions, um, lack of control over work, sort of the infiltration of gig economy stuff into healthcare. Um, so we, as a local um, and as a kind of research outfit, began looking at large scale systemic ways that we could not just um, re, you know, help force proper classification of contract workers, which was part of this problem we were seeing, but to create um, an environment that would be more asset rich and benefit rich for healthcare workers um, wanting to have you know, long careers with wage growth and um, things that we all want. So, um, but after deciding you know, through a lot of <laughs> like research and talking and thinking that the, you know, of the sort of options that rose to the top that were hiring halls and um, registries and all the different sorts of um, ways to look at assembling um, and kind of cornering a labor supply. A, a worker cooperative is is what we were convinced was the, the most meaningful way to um, help workers in our union and, and also outside of our union. Um, and so the sort of test of this was um, a cooperative of licensed vocational nurses. Um, there were a set of nurse of LVNs in our local who um, wanted to create this and be on the, on the executive board of the co-op. Um, and a, a key piece of what they wanted to do was to do home visits um, for women who were in a Medi-Cal program called um, Comprehensive Perinatal, Perinatal Services, um, which is a series of of visits for pregnant women that um, clinics often have a hard time getting patients to come in for. Um, so they thought if they were able to go visit people in their homes, um, people would show up to appointments and there'd be uh, better outcomes. So long story short, so I don't take up too much time, the pilot um, was successful by basically every metric um, in terms of like appointment adhesion and how happy patients were, but um, also very importantly, how the workers felt about about doing that kind of work, um, about bargaining, what it was like to bargain a contract with, uh, you know, as a um, as a worker owner in a co-op with the union, um, which they did. Um, so then, much more recently, like within the last um, six about six months, um, you know, feeling like like that was successful. Plus, we have so many great examples um, like cooperative home care associates and just really wonderful examples of successful and um, and you know long long functioning worker co-ops especially helpful to to look for examples in um, for us in the care sector which there are a great number of um, we felt we felt good about um, you know spending staff resources and on developing a, a bigger multi-classification 
worker cooperative for healthcare workers. Um, so that's been launched. It's called Allied Up Cooperative. Um, and this is for temporary short-term and long-term placement of, um, of allied healthcare workers. And a, a one piece of the kind of design of that co-op is that part of the labor supply for the co-op comes from Futuro Health, which is a, um, it's a nonprofit that was created through collective bargaining with Kaiser in our last round of bargaining um, that does education and training to get people into good middle-class healthcare jobs. So newly credentialed um, folks that come out of the Futuro pipeline um, have the opportunity to join Allied Up Co-op to, to get jobs. So um, the sort of education to work um, pipeline, the Allied Up is a key piece of that. Um, so that's, well, you know, I, I feel hopeful about it scaling. Um, I think there's about 40 or so people who have been placed so far um, in, in, uh, through Allied Up into hospitals. Um, and yeah, so it's exciting. And aside from the appeal of finding alternative organizing paths, which is some re uh, one reason that a lot of us kind of look at this intersection of organized labor and, and co-ops and worker ownership. Um, I think that, or I hope that this partnership between Allied Up and the co-op um, will deepen mem member engagement, help stabilize career pathways, and um, like I said, promote access to wage growth and um, reduce turnover, all these things that are also especially important um, during dealing with the pandemic in terms of um, workers really having a employment model that's both accountable to them as workers um, and to, to their communities. Thanks, Ray. I realize not knowing who's, it's, it's, our conference is going virtual like this. We don't really see who's in the room. So I can't say raise your hand if, but I am asking you now to put in the chat, if you're very familiar with unions, you can give it a five, not familiar at all, give it a one. So we have a sense as we speak and fill in the gaps um, who may be in the room. I'm gonna thank you, um, Marika. I'm going to uh, turn to one more slide and introduce Troy Walcott. Let me try this slide feature again. Um, And this is to introduce Troy, who's been part of the founding team of People's Choice Communications with uh, IBEW Local 3. Um, Troy, go ahead and I'll stop sharing in a second after people can see this great picture of the dem of the strike. Okay, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, hello everyone, um, Troy Walcott. A member of IBEW Local 3, myself and 1,800 of our workers uh, worked for what was Time Warner Cable before Spectrum took over in 2016. So our story goes as most of the cable system for New York City we built out over the past 40 years for Time Warner Cable until in 2016 Spectrum came in to take over the company. So uh, shortly after that, we saw that they started to gear away from customer service and more towards uh, corporate profits. In turn, they also looked to attack the union part of the workforce being us. So in 2017, that came to a head when they sat at the bargaining table and looked to take away all of our retirement benefits, our medical benefits, looking to contract out our work. So at that point, we went on strike. It wasn't too soon into the negotiations that we saw they had no intention of fairly bargaining, especially once the chief negotiator for their side told us at the bargaining table, he promises on his mother's grave, we'll never get back our retirement and medical benefits. So at that point, we figured out we had to do something different. Um, as the union does, they worked to fight on both a political and legal end to bring a means to the strike that along with pressure from withholding um, the workers doing their part by withholding the the technical capacity to service the system was the, the path forward for, for ending a strike. We had something different in mind once we saw the route that the company was going, and that was to get together as individuals, but also as union members. And we decided we wanted to pool our funds together personally to try to come up with an idea that we had where the city can own the cable system. So it would be municipally owned. We went, hired someone to put together a business plan because we know cable service, we don't know business. We presented that business plan to the city. Elected officials said that they liked it. It was a good idea, but no one actually took the ball and ran forward with it. 
So from that point, you said we said to ourselves, you know what? We built out the cable system in the city over the past 40 years. The customers hate the cable system and what's happening to them. Uh, worse services for higher rates. Let's get together and join with the community so we can own the cable system and basically remove the one bad actor in the middle, which was the cable company. And that brings us to what our idea is of now where we have, um, I didn't know it was actually a cooperative until after we put it together, but a multi-stakeholder cooperative where the workers combine with the customers to have ownership of the cable company. And that's what we're working on building out now. Um, I believe our strike is one of the longest in US history. About the three year mark of that strike is when we were able to get philanthropic dollars in order to try to start the build out of our system. Um, that's one of the things we're doing right now, building out in parts of the Bronx and Harlem to be able to provide that cable service throughout. Uh, one of the biggest things I can see from this process uh, was in several different aspects of how it could have ended. And it, it all relates a lot to what I would say is the power that people have underlined within them that is not utilized. If at any point in time, all the customers who were tired of the bad service and what the company was doing would have pulled together and say, you know what, if you don't change, we're no longer buying a service, that would have ended. As uh, workers coming in, if you see people who are being mistreated and moved out of their job because a company wants to just gain power and no one would have gone to work for them, the strike would have ended because no one would have worked for them. And as workers, I think it was because we had a background of union behind us that when we were going through this process of the strike, we didn't just easily disband. We had a collective goal when we worked together. And I think that kind of mindset helped us have the same collective goal when we thought about building this company out to be able to now take back what was taken from us. Um, if you look at building out a city over the 40 years and we're walking through these neighborhoods and knowing that most of everything that these people are using for the service is things we built with our own hands. The question to ourselves and why couldn't we do it again? Uh, we are part of a union, but also we are, I think that gives us the mindset of collectively operating together. That harnessing of the people power in one collective group, I think is what put us to the point where we are now um, building out a system, building a system brand new that we also have ownership in uh, for both us and the customers that we plan our service in. So we see we see this as taking this beyond this is not just about building the cable system. Um, some of the people that we provide a service to are people in supportive housing like NYCHA developments here in New York City. So to be able to now give some power back and equity, equity to those people that we're servicing, using some of the profits to reinvest in those communities, we see this as more now not just a, a cable system or system anymore, but also an organizing tool that we can use to build power within ourselves and also the people that we plan on servicing with this uh, with this system. Great. Thanks, Troy. I'm going to invite people to put some questions in the chat in a little while. I'm going to move to Casey to tell a story about Snow River. Casey, I'll share the screen and you can just say to me next slide. Okay? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I'm Casey Whitnamadon. I'm a staff attorney for the IUE CWA. The IUE is the Industrial Division of the Communication Workers of America. And I got an assignment about two years ago. Uh, we had a plant closing which unfortunately, if you're in manufacturing, is actually uh, uh, very common, unfortunately, and it's a very difficult thing. Um, they said, you know, Casey, you know, you know about employee stock ownership plans. We had a plant in Dayton that was employee owned. They said, take a glance at it, you know, and I was like, OK, you know, I, I certainly wasn't uh, very optimistic. Right. Usually when a plant is closing, it's for a good reason. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, I went up to uh, I went to uh, northern Wisconsin, where this plant is located, and it's it's located located in a beautiful area. Um, and it's been it's a, been there for about 100 years. They've moved through different uh, phases of the business. But to, at the phase that it was in, they were making uh, uh, wood boards from, uh, you know, uh, beautiful, beautiful wood boards for butcher boards and, and shower grates, all types of wood products. Most of the workers were there uh, 30, 40 years, highly skilled. They could uh, fix any machine in the plant. It was down to the end and they had lost uh, their customer. Uh, they had lost uh, Walmart. Walmart was actually their main 
customer. And uh, so the, the, the whole corporation, which was Columbian Snow River, it was about three different plants, was uh, shutting down. Now, the plant manager of this particular plant, Snow River, kept saying, you know, uh, it's not we don't have to close. And uh, at first I was very pessimistic, but we we sat down. Uh, he shared the numbers with me um, and he was absolutely right. The 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 margins from Walmart were terrible and the margins from the custom side of the business were like 30, 40 percent. OK. And then he kept saying, well, you know, without corporate, we can make a lot more money. Corporate is taking way too much money, you know, and you hear that a lot. I wanted to see the numbers, but we did look at the numbers and sure enough, corporate was doing, you know, pretty simple things, accounting, legal, all this. And they were taking an unbelievable amount of money. The, the, you know, we could do the same services for, for much cheaper. So he was right on the margin part. And he was, it looked to me, he was right on the, uh, on the, on the corporate overhead. So I said, you know, this might be able to be done. So actually at, at, at the co-op, at the Cincy Co-op Symposium two years ago, believe it or not, we were in that church in Cincinnati and I met with shared capital there and uh, we met in the church basement and I um, we had the plant manager on the phone and we talked about the numbers and we talked about the strategy and shared capital was interested. At that point, the plant manager had a good enough relationship with the owner that we talked about buying the plant. Um, and then at that point, after we had those pieces in place, I called the local union because this is a pretty big local union and the local union actually provided the health insurance. So that's another asset is that the union could provide the health insurance. So I got together and this is a large uh, amalgamated local, as they, as they say. So they, it's multiple plants. So the officers came up to Wisconsin. I came up to Wisconsin. Uh, next slide, please. And we sat down. Um, we sat down with all the workers. Uh, one at a time. And, uh, and we actually, we, we asked them a few questions, right? We asked them, um, uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doing this out of order, aren't I? I'm not really doing this according to the slides. Next slide, please. We, we sat down with all of them and uh, all these beautiful folks. We asked them if they trusted the plant manager. We felt that that was one of the important questions to ask. Do they trust their plant manager? They all said, yes. That Then we also asked them other questions, you know, this may be very difficult at first, right? You might face temporary layoffs. There might be wage cuts. They said, yeah, we're, we're okay. We don't want to lose our jobs. They were all, they were all in. They were very mature. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. They were very uh, mature about it. I'm sorry. I didn't. Um, so they were very mature about it. I felt like they had a good head on their shoulders. They all knew what they were getting into. Um, so, we um, we kept working. We brought in some some partners. Actually, I talked to uh, Co-op Dayton. Of course, Co-op Dayton is great people, and and they they were you know first of all they're from Dayton and they couldn't help up in Wisconsin, so they connected me to the uh, University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives. Great people up there. Uh, Courtney Burner helped a lot. Uh, uh, Esther West helped a lot. They also connected us to uh, North Country uh, Cooperative foundation. We got some technical help there. So we're writing the business plan, writing the bylaws, and we're trying to do this extremely fast, right? So the first time that we thought that um, uh, funds were available was November. Uh, next slide, please. By, you know, we had already started to work on the business plan by January, the bylaws by February, and we were able to um, make, the, make the purchase with the loan from shared capital and a couple of a couple other uh, capital sources and to buy the plant and um, by uh, April, by April. So it was about a six month process, which which is very fast. I would not suggest it. It was kind of hectic, but it was necessary. Right. The, it the plant was actually supposed to close at the end of 2019. Um, and we had just kept asking, you know, the owner for just a little more time, just a little more time. We're going to get the capital together. We're going to write up the bylaws. So the good news is they bought the plant and 100 uh, percent. So the business plan, uh, you know, shed a lot of costs from corporate and so on and so forth. The business plan said if we can make one point five million, 
we can pay all our costs and that'll be great. And as, as all of you know, if you, if you say you're going to make 1.5 million, you're probably going to make 1.2 million, right? You're probably going to make 1 million, but they were over 2 million before the end of the year. So they, they were absolutely crushing it with the custom side of the business. And it, and, and, uh, you know, they had actually went way down. They were paying parts of their health insurance and they were down to $15 an hour before the uh, closure of the business. But uh, we just negotiated a contract um, earlier this summer uh, in one day. Um, and we were able to get uh, $11 an hour increase up to 26. So that's about 70, 70 percent. Uh, so big raises and 100 percent of the insurance covered. Uh, one of the interesting things I think about this was to me, it really underlined the importance of the union cooperative rather than just a cooperative. And I'll tell you why. I became close friends with the plant manager, Brian Sinclair. I think he's a great guy. On the other hand, he is an entrepreneurial guy. He does. He is not necessarily like a, a, a Bernie supporter. He's not necessarily a union guy. You know, he's not a cooperative guy. He t he went with the cooperative route because um, that was that was the only way to save his job. Right. And um, he he had given himself a raise in between negotiations and the next year that the workers were kind of upset about. On the other hand, everybody was happy to have their jobs. Everybody was happy. So there was this weird aspect where the initial board was everybody. Right. The initial board in the bylaws is all eight people. But even with that pure of a form of worker democracy, there was still a disparity of power. And this is one slide back. There was still a disparity of power between the, um, the plant manager because of his charisma, because he had saved the plant, and because of his knowledge. And it still took the union as an outside party who was less wowed by the plant manager. You know, we're, you know, we think he did a great job turning this into a cooperative, but to kind of check his power a little bit. Um, and I think that's why, uh, you know, I guess as, a, as an analogy economically to the kind of the American system, it's important not just to have one branch of democracy, right? A lot of worker cooperatives, they, they essentially have one branch where that board of directors is the only democratic entity. I think the union is extremely important as another balancing entity. And another reason I think that that's the case is because a cooperative on its own, they can almost think of themselves as just separate from the labor movement, separate from workers. We're just small business people over here in this little bubble of democracy. The problem with that is if they're in a highly competitive business, other businesses and their low labor costs are going to pull down the cooperative's ability to pay good wages and benefits. So I think that being a union cooperative connected to the larger movement is really important to both check the uh, isolating tendency of the cooperative, but also it's good for the union on the other hand, because I think it's good to, for the union to think big about, yes, you know, we are an entity fighting for wages and benefits, but what, what's the larger purpose here, right? It's to empower workers, it's to increase economic democracy. So I just really think that the synergy there is huge. Um, I, it's, you know, we're not out of the woods. The, the cooperative is doing great economically. The workers are doing much better economically. One of the things I'm worried about in rural Wisconsin is now that they're doing so well, you know, um, will they drop the union? That's a serious, serious um, issue. And all of them are very thankful. They're very thankful to me personally. They're very thankful to the other officers personally. They're very thankful to the union in general. But I also am, you know, there are, it's in rural Wisconsin. There are, there's one person in the plant who is an employee who, who has never joined the union, right? And she even said to me, thank you, you know, for everything you've done, but she never joined the union. So there's always a question of, you know, have we done the political groundwork to, to make this a lasting entity? And that's another thing I want to bring up is that I think sometimes in the cooperative world, people focus too much on this is just a really convenient business. Oh, it's just a beautiful type of business entity. No, this is a political and philosophical project. A cooperative is not necessarily easier than a capitalist business. 
it's more democratic. And, and I think people have to be dedicated to that democracy and that equality. So I don't know if I went over my 10 minutes, but uh, thank you so much for listening. I'm noticing that Rebecca um, dropped off. She must be having a computer issue. Um, but I know that next up was going to be um, Liz Ryder. I thought I came last. Angelica is next, isn't she? Oh, no. Um, I'm here um, just assisting for support. Okay. Uh, okay well, thank you. Um, I was going to, and thank you, Casey, that the last comment was just dead on. We need to do better political education. Um, and, you know, unions need to do better political education as well as co ops. Uh, because I'm a 30, uh, a 20 year veteran of uh, 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 being staff at uh, some of the largest unions. Um, so um, I'm speaking today on uh, on downtown Crenshaw. I'm standing in for Nikki Okuk, uh, and who is a the president of the board of downtown Crenshaw. Now downtown Crenshaw is a project which is in Los Angeles South Central, and it's uh, uh, you know I'm sorry I'm here. There should be a, a community member here, but you've got me. <clears throat> So it's a, uh, you know, a community which is one of the oldest African-American communities the side of, um, of, um, of the Mississippi. And it's, uh, you know, was historically and culturally extremely important uh, and uh, being gentrified out of existence. Um, and so you have this profiteering in uh, Los Angeles real estate and then homelessness, you know, growing. Uh, at, at dramatic rates in Los Angeles. And uh, Downtown Crenshaw is a project that is attempting to get right smack in the middle of that and stop the gentrification. Um, and so they, they started off by creating a, a community land trust. Uh, and uh, the community liberty land trust was in existence uh, already when uh, a, one of the iconic properties in South Central uh, came onto the market, which is called the Crenshaw Mall. And ironically, it is 40 acres, and all we need is a mule. <laughs> uh, so there are three developers that uh, tried to, uh, you know, bid on this process. Now, downtown Crenshaw came uh, up with a very uh, professional team. They have the architects and, and developers that created the, um, the uh, Smithsonian uh, African American Museum in Washington, D.C. as part of their team. They have a world-class legal team. A uh, whole network of African American lawyers around the country that are uh, assisting with them. Uh, and they have uh, really, uh, you know, developed a, a world class proposal and had the highest bid, uh, 115 million dollars for this mall, and still were uh, repeatedly denied uh, access. So that you you really can't deny that this is again a, a recurrence of the historic uh, occurrences in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, like redlining. Um, you know, and you can't help but say black money ain't green here because uh, they had the highest bid. Uh, and yet three times the um, organization that was in charge of the bid, of taking the bid, uh, gave it to other developers. You know, so, you know, they have to be doing backdoor deals. The first one was CIM Group. This is uh, affiliated with the Kushner Group. So, um, you know, we have a sort of Trump Kushner element in the background. The second one was Live Work, again, associated with the Kushner Group. Um, then the third one, who actually, uh, the, both of them, all three of these, they were actually a, a, a awarded the bid. Uh, but in the first two, CIM Group and um, the Live Work Group, uh, the fight back from the community managed to discourage investors. And so they had to withdraw their, you know, get out of the, uh, get out of the way. And uh, they managed to crush that, those bids. The third one, which is uh, Schwartzman is leading that bid, they, uh, the group that was uh, uh, overseeing the sale um, you know, finally gave them the bid, even though it was not the highest bid. Okay, now here is the importance of that. Here's the importance in this context of that uh, most of the investors in um, the downtown Crenshaw Mall were union pension plans. <laughs> These are union, in the biggest one in Los Angeles, which is part of my union, asked me, where the county workers here in Los Angeles. Uh, so here you have a, a, a union, which is primarily African-American as well, and living in South Central, where their union pension plans are actually being used to you know, take this away from the African-American community uh, and you know, create more on uh, uh, homelessness. And, and all they wanna do is build these luxury condos in this area. 
so, uh, you know, I think this brings uh, to bear the fact that it's so important for us to bring the union movement along because, you know, there's many uh, issues that if we just raise the one word, the unions get behind uh, defeating that. But we need to get the, you know, the cooperative movement out there so that they acknowledge that uh, this is this is part of the union movement, the labor movement, and just automatically fall into line to come out and support these things. The, the local union here uh, did send letters and whatnot, uh, but, you know, we needed more from it. There are other union pension plans, things like, you know, the fire department in Detroit, and it was a whole consortium of union pension plans and other investors. But the biggest block were union pension plans. But they, the sale was being represented by an organization called Capri, and uh, Deutsche Bank was acting as the bro broker. So Do Deutsche Bank, I don't know if you know about Deutsche Bank, but it's, you know, douche bank, we call it, because it's just behind some of the worst, uh, you know, <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> in the national context, but that's our nickname. Um, so the, um, you know, they moved ahead to give it to, uh, you know, uh, give the bid to Schwartzman, even who was backed by a Russian investor who is the richest man in the UK, whose name, I'm sorry, I can't remember or pronounce, but, you know, you can look them up. Um, and um, so, you know, uh, again, they're going to build luxury condos, they're going to do profiteering, they're going to you know, make hordes of money, and this community is negatively impacted. But downtown Crenshaw is not giving up because there is a model coming out of the, the Bay Area called Monster in the Mission, where uh, it took five years for uh, community groups to oppose a very large development in the Mission District of San Francisco, but they finally won. So uh, now downtown Crenshaw has gone into the mode of now uh, organizing against the approvals and permissions that are required to move the development forward in this mall and um, are going to um, you know, spend the next five years, obviously, uh, opposing all that at every level of, of city and county government. Um, the, but, you know, the uh, downtown Crenshaw is not stopping there because, again, they started with the community land trust uh, before the mall came onto the market, and now they're continuing with that uh, community land trust to create cooperative housing, and they're buying both commercial and residential spaces in South Central. Uh, they're in escrow. They've already bought a couple of residential. They're in escrow on about four commercial properties in South Central. And that brings us to what we're doing about worker cooperatives. They, they want to create Mondragon in South Central, uh, both with cooperative housing and with cooperative businesses and to place into those commercial properties. Because, you know, they want to create, they want to stabilize uh, locally owned, you know, black owned businesses in South Central. Uh, and um, the with my group, which is Works, Worker Ownership Resources and Cooperative Services, and Lucy Los Angeles Union Cooperative Initiative, is assisting with uh, creating a development group that will create multiple cooperatives to fill those spaces in South Central. Uh, so uh, we're starting with, um, we've invited kind of the strategy. We want to be very strategic because we want these things to succeed. And so what we've been doing is looking at inviting in other development groups from around the country that have successfully created networks of worker cooperatives around the country and invite them into South Central, uh, at least the ones that are, you know, have a, a, a cooperative model that is uh, that reflects a need to the uh, community. So our first project has to do with creating a uh, bakery, which is we're inviting uh, Arizmendi, and we're just about to put in our proposal into the Arizmendi group to have them come in and recreate an, the Arizmendi bakery in, in South Central Los Angeles, but also invite in their network. So one of the things which really leads to success in these situations is, uh, excuse me, is, um, you know, a, a support network. So you don't just create uh, a cooperative and abandon it, but you, you create a network that then co con continues to support um, the cooperative through its, uh, by providing business services and, and professional services. Uh, and that's uh, what Works is attempting to create right now. Uh, and we've been doing this for about a year, so we're fairly far down the uh, down the road. Um, let's see, they've been very successful in terms of their fundraising, uh, downtown Crenshaw. They actually, many of the um, sort of uh, very large funders um, to the amount of some $48 million, you know, because many of the, um, the funders that were giving money to downtown Crenshaw were basically saying, look, we recognize reparations need to happen here. Let me let me start here. Uh, and they, after the, the sale of the, the bid was accepted by um, the Schwartzman group, 
uh, downtown Crenshaw went back to all of their funders and said, well, would you, you know, we, the bid has been uh, given to somebody else. Uh, you know, do you want your money back or would you like to um, uh, in the group and we're going to do these other things, such as buying residential and commercial properties in South Central to try to, make the, uh, to stop gentrification. And most of them said yes. So they have about $30 million that they are uh, putting forth into this residential and commercial spaces uh, in South Central to try to stop gentrification and grow essentially an ecosystem replicating uh, Mondragon uh, in South Central Los Angeles. Did I think that's that I, th I think you're good, Liz. Can you hear me? Yep. Can I be heard? I was thrown off. Um, yeah. It is what it is. Uh, yeah. I think we got to your last slide, Casey, when I got thrown off, so people might have seen the victory slide. Um, and there was a, a slide for you. I'm not going to play with, oh, we lost Liz now. I guess she, <laughs> and I hope Rhonda can hear. Um, I'm sorry we lost you, Liz. This is, a uh, you know, the age we're in without good internet service, Troy. Um, I, I wanted to sort of invite us to talk more about this notion of small, one company at a time and strategic thinking of a sector and a region. And the region conversation really shows up in what Liz was just sharing, but it also shows up in Mondragon and it shows up here in Co-op Cincy and Co-op Dayton and Preston, the Preston model in the UK. But I wanted to really, I noticed that Phil Amadon was on in the chat at least earlier. And he was, I think, as I got it like 20 years ago on a trip to Mondragon with other people in the union movement in this region. And they came back with this idea and it takes time. So, and part of that time is the legacy of his son now in a, un, you know, in a position of leadership in a union to make this happen that, you know, and sometimes we just grab the time we're in, which Troy did, even though they've been on strike for four years, two years in, they like grabbed the opportunity. So a combination of grabbing an opportunity and the and, and the long game, that also was a broad game where the union can play. I wanna ask anyone in the room to speak to that, Ray, I know that with SEIU in a couple different locations that's been um, active and I see Liz is gonna be able to come back in, maybe. Sorry. Hi, Liz. <laughs> I was just inviting us to talk about the micro and the macro conversation of one union, one company at a time, um, and or uh, the capacity of really thinking strategically, geographically, or in a sector, and what that can do when we have lots of unions play like in Co-op Cincy, like in Preston Model, like the vision for um, Crenshaw. Anyone want to jump in on that? Yeah, I can. Um just from the perspective of trying at least to have a more in industrial or sectoral view of um, how we would help develop co-ops. Um, I mean, part of that is, I guess, maybe risk tolerance um, because there is there is an investment in a lot of ways in developing, um, you know, developing a co-op from the union perspective that you, I mean, you don't know if, if the workers ultimately are going to unionize. So thinking of it formally as an organizing tactic isn't, doesn't really, it's not totally linear. Um, but from a much more macro perspective, like Rebecca started out with about the kind of common shared values um, that, are, that worker ownership and organized labor share, it feels like absolutely the, the thing to do. Um, and so that that is the perspective we tried to come back to. I, I mean, I suppose it's helpful that we're a statewide local. So we generally think of things in terms of like large healthcare systems in California. That's usually our framework or our lens anyhow. So I think that that's useful. Um, and I'm sure other people um, have talked to this. Too, that there's, there's kind of the other end of that spectrum where focusing on, on a smaller geography can also be really powerful. Like, I don't think necessarily this has to be scaled to be really meaningful for the people who are um, you know, contributing labor towards the enterprise. Um, it just so happens that for our project that we are trying um, to work, you know, to sort of take a piece of the, of the staffing labor market. And so scale is particularly important because of that. Um, our view of it as a sector developing the co-op was kind of key. 
Yeah, and you know, I think also you stayed in the game, Ray. When I see you know, COVID came, change, things were changing. You, the union was able to keep you as a researcher and a lawyer in the game to think of the next thing, the next opportunity and some of that play for um, sim similarly skilled workers being thrown into different circumstances. Um, anybody else wanna say some things on this? I see there's, a tw yes, Casey. Yeah, I was going to say, sure. I think, you know, one of the parts of the stories that I was unable to tell, you know, in the 10 minutes was that the IUE necessarily and a lot of different unions aren't necessarily immediately bought into work cooperatives. It's kind of a building process, right? Unions are political uh, organizations and they can lean to the, you know, center. They, there can be uh, uh, presidents who are elected who don't like the idea of cooperatives. And so IUE actually is deeply connected with co-op Dayton and actually provided some kind of grant money to help uh, generate the uh, Gem City market, right? So there was already kind of a background of, okay, there's some staff and there's some, there's some community members and there's some union members who are already into cooperatives. So that process of getting to the point where they would even respect the idea enough to say, Casey, we got a plant closing, take a look at a worker cooperative, right? That was even a step to get there. And now that we're there, you know, we're working with uh, some really good folks out in New Jersey for workers equity to look at different buyouts, right? And it's not necessarily always going to be the case, but these are slow things like to bring the union along, right? Because the union are elected bodies. So you got to bring these officers along. And I just feel like, um, I, you know, to, to speak to a little bit about Troy's um, ideas, I just feel like that there are so many times when the public sector is providing the money, the people are doing the work, the customers are getting a product, and there's just this middle person extracting money, right? It's, it's, so I, I love the idea because the IUE actually, you know, um, represents people who, I don't want to get into a debate about military, but people who work on bases, people who fix planes, et cetera, maintenance people. Um, and the government is providing the money. The maintenance people are the skilled workers who do all the skilled work. And there are really these companies that really don't know what they're doing whatsoever that just come in and extract profit from that scenario. And it's really doesn't serve the taxpayers. It doesn't serve the workers. And uh, that could be a strategic industry that we get into. It's called, you know, Ed, the SCA, the Service Contract Act. And there are employees all over the country that work under SCA contracts where the employees are doing the work and a different company is bidding. And these companies just come and go. They're really worthless, right? They're just a couple HR managers, uh, some profit extracting people. The workers stay the same. They're still doing the same work. The different contracting company changes, you know. Anyhow, that's my uh, thought on kind of a service that we should, as a co-op movement, look at the service contract. Act. No, it's, it's big, and I think it's it's mimicked somewhat in the service uh, provided by the um, the the nurses or that or the vocational nurses in California. That it was a service, and it was like, who are they working for? Changes, but the skill is the same. And we can really think about that for long-term planetary sustainability. Who we work for can change, especially if we own that. And then who, we have the skills to make the changes we need without the extracted profit. I, I noticed, um, do, I don't know Troy, if you want to jump in or I'll do it, go to a question that I see in the chat. So did you want to say, add something, Troy, or go to a question in the chat? Oh, Liz. Okay. Troy, Troy, Liz, and then I'll do the question from John McNamara. Well, I just wanted to ask everybody on this uh, call to please consider joining the Union Co-op Council of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. We have multiple task forces working on issues to, you know, again, bring the labor movement up to speed on uh, the worker cooperative community and what it means to the labor movement. We have the case study task force. We've identified over 30 union worker cooperatives not all of them currently even in business, but you know, even those ones that have gone out of business have valuable lessons. And so we want to document these over 30 union worker cooperative projects so that it's available to the labor movement uh, to understand what worked, what didn't work. 
Uh, we also have a, a labor, uh, local labor outreach. So uh, what we want to do is get to the, the county level, uh, county federations of labor, AFL-CIO, as well as local labor unions, you know, uh, local labor leaders and, la and local uh, staff and give them educational uh, materials which are geared toward the issues of the labor movement. And so uh, please consider joining and uh, volunteering with our, our task forces at the Union of Club Council. Thanks, Liz. I see Maddie put in the chat a link so you can sign up and get a read of this. Um, you know, I think there was a question from John that referenced some uh, previous panel. How can we connect some of these new holding company models, Main Street, Phoenix, Oberon, that promise massive scale to connect with labor unions so that workers don't get lost in the mass organizations? And I, I want to ask that question and also invite anyone who wants to speak to sort of, so what if, what if a union, some unions were to step in in a big way? And what could that look like? And we're already seeing it in small ways. How can we imagine more? Anybody? I'll tell you a couple of things that I, you know, I, I always repeat. Uh, you know, one that came up in the in the case of uh, the downtown Crenshaw is we have enormous resources, uh, not just in the labor unions currently, but also in terms of investment of the pension plan. Uh, the the building trades created something called the building trade trust, which they invest in uh, building projects that have that result in union jobs, both in the building of it but also in the, uh, in the workers that populate that space after it's built. You know, think Las Vegas Casino. Those are built by union labor and also populated by union workers. Uh, but also, you know, the, um, the other uh, way is in lobbying, you know, especially public sector unions. I was a retiree. I am a retiree from AFSCME and SEIU. So these are, these are lobbying giants. We want to be working with lobbying giants uh, to lobby for what you know is good for workers, which includes worker cooperatives. We need to get that on their their radar to be able to you know advocate for a Macora law, law in you know the United States. Where in Italy they have uh, you know you can get your your unemployment insurance all at one time if you have a, a group of other people that want to create a worker cooperative. Uh, so we need to be able to lobby to create these sorts of laws. Uh, for uh, for our uh, environment as well. And we froze. I think oh, uh, I think Rebecca is frozen. So um, would you take over being chair? Oh, does Rebecca come back? No, I was just going to say. Um, so I think we have a couple questions here. Uh, uh, there was one question, how can we connect some of these new holding company models that promise massive scale to connect with labor unions so workers don't get lost in mass organizations? One thing I would answer to that is the best way to be pro-union is just to sign a, a, a good neutrality agreement, right? Like that's the work will, will be done from there. And if I think, uh, you know, uh, one of the people who actually helped with Snow River, uh, Esther West, who was... Uh, a worker owner for, uh, gosh, what's that coffee company? I'm trying to think of it. Uh, it's not coming to me, but it was a worker cooperative without union. And and she has a very interesting take that that kind of agrees with my point of view, which is that sometimes a worker cooperative is not enough. Sometimes that board of directors can be a little bit, uh, you know, dictatorial. And it's better to have a multi multi uh, uh, branch worker democracy, I guess you could say, you know, one to check the other. So. I, I do think the best way to get some of these larger company models on uh, is sign a neutrality agreement, you know. Well, and then we also want to get uh, first right of refusal language into every contract in the United States so that workers, when their contract is being re renegotiated, they include language that says they, the workers have a, a first right of refusal to purchase that, that company if um, that company is being sold. And that will result in many more worker cooperatives and much more uh, local control of the economy. Yeah, I would also just add to bring unions in early. I think, you know, sometimes there's a tendency to sort of develop something in a bit of a vacuum. And then even even if it's uh, kind of pro-union enterprise to bring the union in later. And I'd advocate that talking to the union early can be really helpful, um, getting insight from, of course, the union members and design questions, bylaws questions, um, that can all be really useful relationally too. 
I agree with that. And part of what we went through as our process through the entire way the union was with us because it converted from a strike towards our efforts to building this out. But having them uh, actually know what was going on as we were building towards this did help at the point where we were ready to launch and move forward and start building out as they were able to lend resource, resources to us to try to now expand and go further, especially now um, we are finishing up like now um, this is what 1200 unit development with a couple of more on the way 4200 units now to be able to scale at the capacity we need be able to rely on the union to be able to be that force behind us helps add to that and give us uh you know some more power behind our efforts i want to apologize i got bounced again i hope everybody got something out of this um what a time we're in but thank you everybody for sharing your stories and helping with some case studies and think about how to influence our unions, which I am constantly reminded when I think of people's choice. We are the union. If our leadership doesn't lead in this regard, let them get out of the way and we will take up some leadership. I want to thank you for that inspiration, Troy. It reminds me of my union carpenter. Lead us out of the way, and I think we can. So I know um, we're supposed to end up at this time, but people want to say a few minutes before they shut the door, we can do that. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Right now, for us to be at the point where we were to where we are right now is even to be here sitting and just talking about our story is incredible. So um, thank you for having me on. Hopefully there's more good things to come behind what we're doing as we push through this. But, and it's also great to hear everybody's stories to know that what we're doing is part of a much larger movement that's happening in different places over and over again. So thank you. Thanks, Troy. I totally agree. It's it's inspiring to, to be on this panel with you guys. I'm really happy, happy to be. Casey, thanks so much for sharing. I think we are also losing Rebecca again. <laughs> I think I'm here. I'm on my phone. But I think we're all supposed to uh, take a few minutes and then at the 45 minute go back for a wine day. Um, my last slide, which we didn't get to use because enough technology not ready, but was really sort of saying so, what would you do? Which of these tools would you take? box and put to work and I looking at tools trying to get unions to um, dedicate some uh, thought partner and leaders you know Casey you were able to do this uh, again shout out to your father Phil for sort of bringing it in a while ago and I appreciate the thought of the long game time to up our game so thanks everybody shout out to Phil hey how you doing? We should talk. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. I think we can leave. I guess whoever's facilitating at the door. I thought we were supposed to end like at the other session. I was thrown out of the particular moment. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Troy. All right, have a good one. Thank Thanks, you, Rebecca. Thanks for being so. Take care. Bye bye.